back a year ago. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the Beer Bound Podcast. We're excited to be joined today by Professor Dan Malik. Professor Malik is an internationally recognized expert in drug and alcohol regulation and prohibition. Much of his research pertains to the challenges of regulating substances that are considered socially problematic, including cannabis, liquor, opiates, and cocaine. Dan is a professor in the Department of Health Sciences and the director of Brock Center for Canadian Studies in the Faculty of Humanities. Professor Malik is a published author. His written works include Try to Control Yourself, The Regulation of Public Drinking in Post-Prohibition Ontario, 1927 to 1944. This was published in 2012. When Good Drugs Go Bad, Opium, Medicine, and the Origins of Canada's Drug Laws, published in 2015, and Liquor and the Liberal State, Drink and Order Before Prohibition, published last year in 2022. We're excited to speak to Dan and learn more about his knowledge pertaining to Canada as well as Prohibition. So Dan, without further ado, welcome to the Beer Bound Podcast. How are you? Thank you. I'm well. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The pleasure is hours. So I gave a little bit of information on you, but I'm sure your story is far more profound. So maybe could you touch on a little bit more information about why you were interested in the fields of regulation for illegal or controversial substances? Where does it all begin, Dan? Yeah, you know, that's a, so there's, there's a a small and a big story and we have time. So I'll tell the bigger one, which is, um, First of all, when I was an undergrad, I had a professor who studied temperance. And so in fourth year, I was doing a women's history course and I needed to do a final project. And I thought, oh, there's this group called the Women's Christian Temperance Union. I wonder, let's learn about them. And so I went to this guy, Jack Blocker, who's like internationally known, sort of almost a father of the field and uh, said, you know, I kind of want to do something here in London. I was at Western. So. Um, so I did. And uh, that kind of, I had been interested in British and Irish history. And I started doing this. And suddenly I was doing Canadian history, which, eh, you know, it, it's a thing. <laughs> I, I love it now. But at the time, I was like, oh, I really like the British and Irish stuff. Um, but it just, it's kind of, I hate to say it, but it's addictive, right? Like, it's a really interesting field. You get to do a lot of stuff. I went from temperance into well, I, I tried to get away from it, but then in grad school, I ended up doing something on drug prohibition, um, which became my second book. You mentioned try, uh, When Good Drugs Go Bad. And then when I got to Brock, um, a friend of mine who was working in the communications, popular culture and film uh, department said they're putting together this big project on popular culture in Niagara, and they don't have anyone who does stuff on alcohol. They said, we're in Niagara. Why aren't we doing stuff on alcohol? And I said, that's interesting. What I'm really interested in is what happened in Niagara when prohibition ended in Canada in 1927 and Ontario in 1927, but continued in um, the U.S. until ni- the end of 1933. I thought, what, like Niagara is a border town. What happened? And so that started me looking into Liquor Control Board, which expanded to be my first book, which was um, Try to Control Yourself. And that because I found this massive amount of material um, on the LCBO, the Liquor Control Board. Um, and so I thought, well, I just want to dig into this. And it took about eight years to finish that. But that's that's sort of the, the, the professional side. And the other side is I was raised in a family where we had, I'd say, a fairly healthy relationship with alcohol in the sense that it wasn't, there wasn't, I think my grandfather wasn't, was alcoholic, but everyone else it was just a social thing you did right it it brought people together so I always had this interest in regulation but also in sort of the social side of alcohol so when I got to studying the um the book that he just the last one that came out liquor in the liberal state I was really interested in the the idea of the way alcohol was was dealt with when it was a substance that people knew was very socially I say necessary but a appealing to many people, but also some people saw it as really problematic. What is it about history that interests you? Let's get to know you a little bit better. Why are you interested 
in history. I know you mentioned British and Irish history was a little bit more interesting to you, maybe a little bit more. Yeah. So, so for me, um, it, it, it really came down to having great teachers, right? Like uh, I was at a small college affiliated with Western. And so we had small classes and really great storytellers. So part of history for me was storytelling, but also it was kind of contextualization. It was understanding as my mentor from Queens, Jackie Duffin said, you know, we, we write history to understand today, even though we're looking at the past. We under, not just to understand how we got here, but to understand issues today. Like drug history of drug prohibition is relevant when we look at the decriminalization of cannabis, for example, or the legalization of cannabis or de decriminalization or things like that, because we can understand, we can see the attitudes of the past reproduced now and so we can we can put it in a different context um, i often say history is like when you go traveling to a country that you know nothing about you learn more about your own country when you come back because you've seen other people doing things differently right and come back and say well why do we do these things this way and history is the same way but it's just it's a time travel instead of a geographical travel or ge yeah geographical travel so that's what fascinates me about history I think I share your interest. Well, in terms of your focus and the three texts that we've spoken about and a lot of your academic research and your work, can you discuss a little bit about Canada's history, probably focusing more on its colonial history of and its, its relationship, our nation with substances? What is the context, even going back maybe 200, 300 years in the 18th, 19th centuries? Where does it all begin? What is the foundation of substance use and abuse to Canadians? I don't know how far back I can go because my I study really um, post-Confederation. I mean, my, my work does begin looking at the immediate pre-Confederation period, um, but then post-Confederation. But so so I can't get into things like explorers coming in and sharing alcohol with the people who are already here and things like that. But it in many communities, for example, the tavern was a social center, still is in many communities. But when we talk about taverns today, um, we think about a drinking place, right? Like I'm going to the tavern for a beer, but, or, you know, but back in the colonial period, in the period of settlement uh, of North America, the tavern was where you stopped when you were traveling. It was a place of accommodation, and part of that accommodation was food and drink, right? So um, people didn't just, um, like a tavern didn't just appear in a town so people could go drinking. A tavern was necessary for people who were traveling. And it wasn't just a place where people um, who were strangers into the town went. Um, it was also one of the few places with a public space, right? So traveling salespeople who were called commercial travelers would come, they would stay in the hotel, they would set up a place to show off their wares or they would at use at least use it as a base of operation so in Ontario for example to have a tavern license you had to have stabling for horses and wagons you had to have meals you had to have um bedrooms a certain number of bedrooms before you could even be licensed as a tavern um and then in in some of the bigger cities you could there were a, there were a few places that were exempt from those rules and those were saloons but they were just exempt taverns right and they, they were just drinking places normally um so so that's sort of what i can tell you about the sort of history of, of drinking for example in canada in ontario really more in ontario was the his, it is around that tavern space and how the tavern space existed and was regulated and then at, at times became a, a location of problems right um so some people or I say problems, but, you know, problem is contextual. <laughs> it, some people will call something a problem and others will see no problem. So I'll say location where some people saw a problem, if you get what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, obviously there was some form of a problem in terms of some individual's opinions because that yeah. raised into the cultural fabric of the United States and Canada and North America, the, as you mentioned, the temperance movement, which would eventually go on to lead to legislation, prohibition yeah. in both countries. Can you touch on the foundations of the temperance movement in both countries? Were they similar? Were they different? Yeah, absolutely. So so 
normally we would look there's this is actually a debate among historians so i'll i'll give you the historians not arguing with each other view, version of it okay because really there's back in the uh, 80s and 90s there was a whole bunch of articles saying no it temperance began here no wait they saw it back further no wait they they saw drinking as a problem earlier right it was the the definition of at what point did alcohol like drunkenness or habitual drunkenness become pathologized become seen as as a medical problem or at least a big social problem so i'm going to just talk about the 19th century on and a lot of people point to early in north america the early part of the 19th century or even the end of the 18th century when some people and and even some people from the uk physicians for example started to see something they thought to be um what we would now call addiction they would use the term addiction once in a while they wouldn't use the term alcoholism until much later in the in the century um and they were seeing addiction to alcohol or habitual drunkenness the habitual part being a problem right and that was becoming it was an early form of sort of a disease model of of alcoholism but then uh that was kind of on the medical and the higher level like medical people talking to each other and and physicians weren't always treating all types of patients um because some people couldn't afford physicians so on the other side uh another element of it was um workers for example who were concerned with their economic ability to to function so if you're drunk on monday or tuesday it's kind of tough when you're going into a factory where you know especially in, in mills and stuff like that in like um, textile mills in the UK and in North America there were some as well it's pretty dangerous to be hung over and <laughs> it with those big machines slamming together and stuff like that right so some people saw that as um a problem with their their physical safety um but also there was this growing concern about the productivity of workers right so you see middle class people families or friends or, or um, colleagues of factory owners for example starting to say you know we need a there's something something wrong here this drunkenness thing is a problem and so that's like a middle class view of working class culture so they didn't see the functional value of you know blowing off some steam on a Saturday night because people worked until Saturday afternoon um they saw they just saw dysfunction in drinking um there was also other stuff there's a rise of evangelical um the sort of stronger passionate evangelical churches that saw um you know the whole idea of the body of a temp the body is a temple and therefore you're corrupting it um and uh uh other elements like that so so there was also a concern among the middle class people that if they're becoming if they become alcoholics I'll use the term even though it's kind of anachronistic they will fall like they will become destitute that's called status anxiety right so this idea that you know and there's throughout the temperance literature you may have even seen this stuff there's a thing called the drunkard the drunkard's uh progress right and it's this this series of pictures of a young man he's newly married he goes off to work and one day he goes for a little drink with his work colleagues and that's nice and then the next day he has a few more drinks and then halfway up this it's kind of like an arc an image that's an arc halfway up the arc he's drunken he's fighting and it just slides down into the point where basically his family is thrown out of the on the street and he kills himself like it's a very uh, uh, graphic image right um and so there's this idea that that you know but for the grace of God and my own will go I right so so we don't want we don't want to fall and become destitute and you know suicide or whatever um so there was all of that stuff playing together so the working class people and, and workers just wanting to improve their lives um and seeing because they're not being paid very much seeing you know not drinking being an economic benefit there are middle class people concerned about their own status and also about the productivity of the workers there's evangelical temperance there's all sorts of things coming together so by the middle of the century um in places like Maine which was the first state to have a um a, a statewide prohibition law um this was considered to be a really um a big progressive achievement right um because uh, it was theoretically drying up all of the the low grog shops they would call them all of the the, the filthy low taverns and driving the the booze business out of the state um, so a lot of temperance people pointed to the main law as being like the ideal uh, law, although a lot of others pointed to a, a lot of deep problems with that law. 
and then in Canada in well yeah in Canada in the Canadas right in uh Canada East Canada West Upper and Lower Canada and what became part of Ontario and Quebec we had a law by 1864 called the Duncan Act which allowed individual communities to um, vote themselves dry and Dun it was named after a guy named Christopher Duncan had nothing to do with Dunkin Donuts or anything like that um and this would allow like I said individual communities to vote themselves dry but it also had a lot of complicated legal mechanisms so often the um, opponents to this would challenge it in court and usually it would be thrown out so that was that was a possibility for the temperance movement um so as people started to organize often through their churches or through small community groups they started to agitate more for something more than just the Duncan Act like some kind of prohibition or some kind of uh, restriction on 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 liquor the thing that I'm curious about is what was different about the mid 19th century up to the late 19th century into the 20th century what was unique about this time period that would be that what was the catalyst I guess you could say that would combust the the cultural desire to abolish alcohol so like what was unique or different about this period because alcohol consumption certainly in North America or in Europe not a new concept by any means I mean you mentioned the industrial revolution maybe this was a big facet something that was particularly unique and different about this particular time period yeah I, yeah I don't think there's a there's one answer to that and I think historians still debate it right so part of it is there's an industrialization of the liquor business um the international trade uh, was expanding um the rum business was pretty strong as well um new technology in distilling for example um something called the coffee still or the what's the other word for the still um it was a, a a new type of still that was actually much more efficient and could create a more neutral spirit which could be blended with other stuff so it made cheaper alcohol available um it connect connection with international trade routes right so more more trade meant people could get more products like different types of alcohols um also we can't under um uh, minimize the importance of the evangelical churches like they were strong and growing evangelicalism was a big a powerful force behind some people would argue even behind the the American Revolution but I don't know enough about that to say for sure but definitely by the 1820s and 30s there were these revivals going on so there was camp revivals people would get together and they would just pray and um celebrate God and Jesus and all that stuff that evangelicals celebrate and then evangelicalism was also about conversion right about going out and and helping people it wasn't just about converting them to Christianity or to their version of Christianity but it was about trying to elevate people who were downtrodden and also prepare the way like the, the the phrase in the Bible I think prepare the way for the Lord right and some people argued that what you needed to do is you needed to purify society in order to do that you couldn't have all of this Jesus didn't want to walk around amidst this which was one of the views the other view was he will come and then he will clean things up right but um so so that was a big cultural force along with this um, and connected to this was abolitionism sl of, of slavery right so a lot of the people who um were progressive abolitionists who wanted to get rid of slavery saw this as a scourge the scourge that it was and and um a horrible thing and an anti uh, unchristian and all of that stuff when abolitionism like they 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 were part of a movement that sort of a lot of them got their kind of cut their political teeth in abolitionism and so temperance was another to them another scourge I mean alcohol was another scourge I think temperance was a scourge but alcohol was another scourge right so they would then they turn their attention to hey we know how to do this we know how to lobby for change so that part of it was important too and it wasn't just in the U.S. I mean there were a lot of obviously we had the under underground railway right we, there was a lot of um a lot of connection between within the evangelical churches across the border and the abolitionists and the temperance movement definitely had a lot of connections across um North America uh, I mean and and there was also connections with what was going on in the UK uh, which was much I mean the, the religious aspect was there but there was a lot of um uh, elements of helping the working people improve their lot and it was something that that some of the unions later on were actually quite 
interested in as well. They were advocating this kind of respect, working class respectability that included being temperate. So it wasn't just, wasn't only middle class people imposing their values on the working people. And so as industrialization grew, as you can see where this is going, like as industrialization grew, as um, the evangelical movements intensified and strengthened and became more organized, there was a lot of that kind of a, a convergence of these forces by the, I'd say by the 1860s and the 1870s, right? And then in, in Ontario, for example, they had the kind of the government of the 1870s was kind of un, in line with the progressive reformers of of the temperance movement so they they the temperance folks thought they had a very um, um a willing i guess or at least a receptive government and and it really did depend on which which province you're looking at whether the government was really receptive to um to this sort of change sticking with the United States, because we both have Canada and the United States has a different nuanced history with finally enacting prohibition. I think perhaps the most notable one being in the United States, it was became federal legislation. And in Canada, that never happened. It was at the province level. But can you kind of maybe let's stick to the US first. You mentioned Maine was the first state to enact some form of prohibition. I forget what year you said. I didn't say what year because I can't remember off the top of my head. It was, in the, right. it was in the 1850s. It was in the 1850s. So Maine started it off. Now, can you kind of go a little bit over the decades, what sort of emerged into finally 50-odd years up until 1920 when prohibition became federal legislation? What really kind of tipped the boat over? You know, I can't talk as much about the U.S. process. Um, it was a little more complicated because states have their own constitutions. So um, what happened was the, I mean, I can give you some of the broad strokes because I, I and, and and there's also, we have to be careful not to think that there was just an onward march towards prohibition, right? Like that's what we call in history, we call that presentist, right? We look at the present and go, oh, that's how they got there, or Whiggish, it kind of, anyway. Because as, as my mentor, Jack Blocker, notes, that they were cycles of reform. So they kind of ebbed and flowed, probably with the economy, with the, 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 just the, the interest of people, with different um, things that were happening. Uh, so uh, people, a lot of people have argued that by the turn of the century, by the beginning of the 1900s, the temperance movement was kind of on the wane in some respects. But there was also a, a transition in, uh, I don't know, Eight, I, I, I'm going to be rough, roughly the last quarter of the century or the last third of the century from temperance being about personal conversion per, and personal responsibility, probably even before that, and thinking of the main law, to the main job of the temperance movement to be achieving prohibition. So you see groups like in the U US, they had the Anti-Saloon League. Uh, in the UK, they had the they had a really wordy titled the U United Kingdom of Alliance for the complete the total su suppression of the liquor traffic or something like that. We had the Dominion Alliance for the total suppression of the liquor traffic. And so they went from being, you know, the Women's Christian Temperance Union to the Dominion Alliance for the suppression of the liquor traffic, right? And, and the WCTU was not the only temperance organization. Um, so, but what the, what the Anti-Saloon League was doing was instead of just pushing for state law, they pushed for constitutional change at the state level. That was sort of their way of getting around the fact that you have a government in, in power and they just change the law, right? That's, let's say you get a government that says, okay, we're going to really tighten the rules. And then the next government comes in and says, oh, we're going to loosen them up. Um, so they were pushing for these constitutional changes. And I think and this is where my knowledge of the U.S. prohibition gets a little fuzzy, is that that was what happened by the early 19 teens when um, the push was for a constitutional change in the U.S., which allowed the banning of the manufacture of liquor as well as of the sale. And in, uh, in Canada, um, by contrast, which I know much better, um, the, uh, the the it was very complicated sort of legal uh, jurisdictional battle between um, the federal and the provincial governments, sometimes led by the Ontario government. Um, but the end was provinces had the right to impose prohibition of the sale of liquor, but not of the manufacture of liquor. That was and remains a federal um, jurisdiction. So during the war, during the First World War, when provinces started to impose prohibition, 
Um, the federal government did, I think in 1916, pass a law kind of requiring this, but they couldn't force provinces to impose prohibition. But because of the wartime, um, the wartime, the War Measures Act, the wartime emergency, they could, they had more power than they normally would have had. And so there was a brief period in 1917 to 18 where the manufacturing of spirits, at least spirits, I don't think it was beer and wine, was banned. It all had to be redirected into military production, right? Because um, spirits are used in certain types of um, explosives and stuff like that. And it was, the, but the argument was that it was for um, resource, like for the saving resources, food going to, like grain going to food instead of grain going to, to booze. Um, but again, it wasn't just an onward march. There was ebbs and flows. And in my work in Liquor in the Liberal State, I look at how by the 19, early 1900s, the temperance movement had some uh, achievements, but there was persistent resistance from politicians, even temperance-minded politicians. And it wasn't until the war that the kind of emergency of war allowed, you know, convinced more people that at least temporarily we should get rid of booze for the sake of the nation, like for the sake of the the, the struggle, right, that was going on in in Europe. Obviously, Dan, your focus is more on Ontario and Canada at large. So the U.S. had federal legislation in 1920, which abolished both the sale and manufacturing. Canada was a different story. Now, can you go over just very briefly for folks listening who don't know so much about Canada? We're, we don't have, U.S. has 50 states. We have 10 states, but we call them provinces. Yeah. So can you kind of go, plus our three territories, don't want to forget them. So can you kind of go over how it worked in terms of the geography of Canada? What areas of the country were more interested in the abolition, the prohibition of, of alcohol and which ones were a little bit more liberal? I know like there's a famous story. There's a, an area now, it's just a neighborhood of Toronto called the Junction. And famously now the Junction is very famous for being a it's it's well known, I should say, for being a trendy neighborhood with lots of craft breweries. And the craft breweries in this particular area like to tell the tale that actually for about 100 years, this neighborhood, this area, which was, I believe, originally called, I think, Western Toronto, I think, there was the abolition, the prohibition of alcohol. And it wasn't, reenact it wasn't reinstated or made legal again, I should say, in the late, uh, until like the late 90s or early yeah, 2000s or something. Recent. Yeah, it was in the yeah. Voted. yeah yeah it, it was probably in the 2000s yeah i think so wrong with that no yeah. i think that's right so can you kind of paint us a picture what did canada look like sure so i'll give a little context so so first of all constitutionally um canada and the u.s were very different where this i don't want to go too deep into constitutional law which i can't go too deep into it because I don't know it that well. But the U.S. Constitution had sort of default rights to the states, whereas in Canada, the default right is to the federal government. And what that means is, um, you know, the constitutions lay out the responsibilities of the federal and the provincial government, our, our constitution in Canada. In the U.S., they usually refer to them as states or federal rights, right? States rights, federal right. We hear this term all the time. And my understanding of it is that well, I know that in the Canadian Constitution, if there's something not listed in either of these in either of these sections of the Constitution, like so, provinces have the responsibility for healthcare for the most part and agriculture and things like that, whereas the federal government has trade and commerce and you know, defense and stuff like that. If there's nothing listed, if there's something that's not listed in either of those, the default goes to the federal government. That was the original plan, partly because while the Canadian constitution was being conceptualized and written, there was a civil war going on in the US and people saw that as at least partly an issue of states versus federal rights and the fact that the states had more power than the federal government. But we know it was about slavery, but um, there was also that kind of constitutional issue, right? So the, the framers of the federal, of the Canadian constitution wanted more power for the federal government. And in the U.S., they had the other. So, so in the U.S., that's why, you know, they all have state uh, constitutions. Uh, I don't think we have provincial constitutions, at least not anymore. And so they would sort of outline the different rules for the different states. But but the tr the commerce of alcohol was still federal, right? Uh, but again, states had the rights to impose their own 
forms of prohibition and some of the states did that's why still in in the in the the counties in Kentucky where most of the bourbon is made are dry right you can't actually I don't know if you can buy the stuff at the, at the distilleries but you can't go out to a bar and, and drink it um whereas in so so that's kind of one of the main dif differences so when prohibition came in Canada it was after a series of struggles between the provincial and federal governments over the rights to impose prohibition and the funny thing about this term right is that some argue that um and some from the time argued that the governments didn't actually want that right it was too toxic of a topic right like because a lot of people wanted prohibition or a lot of people wanted the government to impose a lot of restrictions and a lot of people wanted the government to do none of that right like it wasn't just the liquor industry with money with deep pockets you know funding parties it wasn't anything like that there were a lot of people who said just leave us alone this was a time when the principles of a liberal liberal government small l liberal government were small government you know individual freedoms freedom uh you know property rights and equality of, among people the rest of it was like government state of our business right um so governments didn't really want to have that responsibility to be able to prohibit uh, or to manage liquor but at the same time especially in Ontario we had this guy named Oliver Mowat who was the premier for like over 20 years and he and Sir John A Macdonald who was the prime minister really didn't like each other very much and even though they used to work together I think Moet was like articled or something with with McDonald in his law office and they were both um they were both involved in the constitutional conferences that um, led to our the British North America Act so they kind of so Moet wanted more provincial rights and he was fighting with McDonald over all sorts of things with inward in inland water passages like who had the right to to the to regulate you know lumber going down the rivers and things like that and also liquor and it's very clear in the constitution that liquor licensing is a provincial right it, right it says right in section 92 of the constitution um the licensing of taverns and billiard rooms and other such places for revenue purposes right but that for revenue purposes thing was a problem because does that mean you're just the right to get money out of licenses or the right to not to say you can't have a license do you know what I mean like if it says you you are allowed to get the money from licenses some argued that that doesn't mean you cannot license like if someone comes to you and says I want a tavern license you it some say that doesn't give you the right to say no you can't have it it just means that okay I'll give it to you but you have to give me money for it right and, and that so that kind of messy and, and the fact that trade and commerce is a federal or a dominion government um, responsibility but this licensing and and other sort of municipal policing issues in that were provincial led to a lot of court cases right a lot of just fights by the end of the 19th century it had sort of been sorted out and the provinces had way more power than they had in 1867 when the constitution when Canada was created right and so that's why when we got to the point of of the war the federal government just well some provinces had already voted themselves dry um I think Prince Edward Island in 1902 or 04 had gone dry um I think in Nova Scotia it was 1910 but most of the provinces waited until the war and the wartime laws usually well the federal law was provincial uh, prohibition would happen until one year after the end of hostilities uh and then each province except for Quebec um then voted on it in Quebec basically they never supported any kind of federally imposed prohibition it didn't mean that Quebecers didn't want restrictions on liquor in their communities but they wanted it to be a community thing they didn't want and, and there were dry communities in Quebec um, but they didn't want something imposed from the federal government which if you know anything about Quebec politics today completely makes sense right because it's very much in a uh, it sees itself as an autonomous um a unique culture and all of that stuff uh but then so at the end of the war Quebec 1919 one year after end of hostilities they go they go wet again and it becomes a paradise for the jazz musicians coming up from New York right like there's a song called hello Montreal that's all about like you know leaving New York behind because we're going to the wet paradise of Montreal um and then basically roughly west to east um 
Prohibition falls. So in BC, in British Columbia, it's 1921. And then kind of Alberta, I think, is about 26 and rolls across. In Ontario, it's 27. And Prince Edward Island didn't go wet until 1948, after the Second World War. Um, and so it's funny because you think about the culture, the the kind of stereotype of the culture of the Maritimes, the Maritime provinces, and it ain't a dry stereotype by any means, right? But it was a very evangelical, and still is, there are a lot of evangelical communities there. So there was a strong temperance um, sentiment. In fact, PEI was dry before it had voted dry in, um, the, like I said, the early 1900s. Uh, most of the counties, and I think even the city of Charlottetown, had voted themselves dry through through federal laws, federal what's called local option law. Wow. So I kind of went way off topic there. I don't know if that answers one of your questions, but that's why. So we have this spotty, and then when it was reimposed, when prohibition ended, we have different um, licensing regimens re regimes in each province, and th that same thing happened in the states. In fact, a uh, uh, the late great Bill Rorava, who's a historian of U.S. Um, alcohol, said to me at one point, "The reason the uh, the the border states, the northern border states, have stronger liquor control boards or liquor control agencies than the rest of the states is because of the proximity to Canada, because of the cross border sort of trade going on. That they that when prohibition ended, they needed to have stronger laws or more restrictions than than further south." The simplified stereotype of what ended prohibition in the United States, I think, is basically that it didn't work. Abolishing alcohol, getting rid of it, actually created more crime. It didn't stop the consumption of alcohol. It didn't stop the production of alcohol. It's just a failed piece of grand legislation. Is that similar in the Canadian context? You said kind of you had a bit of a domino effect into the 1920s that provinces continue to knock out this legislation, get rid of it? Was it for the same reasons? Were there some different nuanced reasons as to why the oh, Canadian no, provinces it's... got rid of prohibition? Yeah, so, yeah. So, okay, so I have to go back a little further than prohibition to uh, to explain that story, uh, that, that situation. I don't think it would have been a surprise to most people in the 1920s who had been around for a while that prohibition failed. And that's because it had failed repeatedly. The main law didn't work, right? We had local option throughout the country, and it's not that difficult to bring alcohol into your community, right? And and in fact, some people noted that under local option, whether it was at a county level or even just a, a town level or a township level, it sometimes encouraged a different type of drinking and a worse type of drinking than under um regular licensing or under a non-local option right so for example if you know, it's way easier to carry a flask of whiskey with with a bigger punch than a few pints of beer which is usually there in pint bottles right um so that in itself the volume itself was a problem so there was a royal commission in 1893 to 95 which johnny mcdonald struck to kind of get the pressure off his back from the temperance people and they went around the country asking about the local option laws and they found because what happened in Ontario for example is we got this new law in 1878 called the Scott Act named after the guy who wrote it and between 1883 and 88 it just it was passed in many of the counties of Ontario but by 1889 it was gone part of the reason was it had to be in place for three years that was what the law so you couldn't just repeal it the next year and except for one county or maybe two counties that went for four and five years after three years they all ended it and they said this is worse than prohibition i mean than than liquor licensing because there was no control there was no oversight there was no funding for uh inspection uh and there was a lot of like if people want to drink they're going to drink right like fermentation is a natural process right? it's it's not like banning opium where we it doesn't grow very well in Canada so you, you, there's a lot more controls although that didn't work either but um so it was a big problem because they could get it and and legally it wasn't a problem to get it you could go out of your county to a wet county buy the stuff and bring it back in 
a manufacturer in a dry county couldn't sell it in their county, which seemed unfair, but they could ship it to the next county and then people could go over there and bring it back. So it was really, it was impossible to impose uh, or to, um, to enforce. And this was something that they saw in the main act as well. In the, in that Royal Commission, there was a lot of discussion over the effectiveness of the main act and the temperance people were saying, oh, it was beautiful. It was wonderful. It worked so well. Look at the main act and the, the, the wets or the liquor people were saying, uh, no, it wasn't. Like there was a lot of, have you, did you go to Bangor during, pro, during the main act? It was horrible, right? Like, so there was a lot of conflicting views because of this idealized idea of, um, of what prohibition was. So by the time prohibition was, this is one of the reasons why the, the U.S. temperance folks went for a national um, uh, constitutional uh, amendment was because they could make the manufacturing um, illegal, which they knew from past experiences that if you if you had someone in the next county ma making it, it was going to come into your county. Um, in Ontario, we didn't have that kind of law because partly because there were, because the federal government wasn't going to, to impose prohibition. It could; it had the power to do it, a and partly because like the it was just too valuable of an industry and it went at a provincial level it was easier to impose at a provincial level just the banning of sale which meant if you're a distiller or a brewer or a vintner there wasn't a great big wine industry and you're living near detroit or near buffalo right or along the saint lawrence river or on either coast it was pretty lucrative to have the u.s continue to be dry <laughs> so a lot of the stuff about gangsters and speakeasies and things like that that we hear about in the U.S. was fueled by Canadian liquor because it was completely legal to to to, to make it and up until a few years into prohibition at least it was totally legal to export it to the U.S. yes the notorious stories of Al Capone mm -hmm. enjoying Sleeman ale yeah and, and but also like Seagram's walkers all of those mm -hmm. Know, Hiram Walker and Seagram's, uh, um, Goodrum and Warts, they were all, yeah, yeah, doing doing that stuff, and and it was completely legal for them to mm -hmm. do it. Although Mackenzie King, the Prime Minister, did, after some pleading from the U.S., impose, uh, made it illegal to export it to the U.S. So what some places did, and there are these great stories of, you know, rowboats leaving uh, leaving the Windsor docks en route to Cuba. <laughs> right that was just where are you going oh we're going to cuba okay see you later <laughs> back a few hours later how was cuba it was great you know so <laughs> quick that. quick voyage yeah. yeah well dan what was the liquor control act in 1927 i believe what was that and what is its legacy to the province of ontario yes um and and that reminds me that the other side of um that your question was how did the end of prohibition you know how was it different and one of the things mm -hmm. that prior to prohibition the idea of a of a centralized liquor distribution um, business was not really considered government's job it was something that was discussed but it still seemed to be something that that was better left to private industry but after prohibition through a, a lot of things that are really quite clear but it seems to me that um, the model of this kind of centralized liquor distribution system that we have in Ontario and still have seemed to be a better way to reintegrate alcohol into to culture so or into the the community in a legal way. So if you think about alcohol, if we think about alcohol today and we can't really conceptualize how problematic some people thought it was, like imagine it's like morphine or heroin, right? Like, some people saw it as that much of a scourge and you know if you see heroin as a scourge um so when you legalize it in 1927 when the the liquor control act came into place um the government had this really fine balancing act to um to play because temperance was still a very strong for a very i like i don't say to say strong i like to say loud they were very loud they were active they were persistent um, they would, especially in Toronto, in, in, in West, West Toronto, especially, they would be going to the liquor control board saying, this place is selling illegally. And this, you know, they were really kind of a second level of inspection. Um, 
so they really the the liquor control board i'll say the lcbo um needed to um tread that fine line between being too permissive and too restrictive if you're too restrictive people are just going to keep doing stuff illegally drinking in illegal spaces um maybe making stuff that's not really that good for you um like um, wood alcohol and stuff like that if you're too permissive then the temperance movement is going to say look it didn't work we were right you know and they had to really tread that fine line when i started research on the book that came to be try to control yourself i thought i kind of bought into the the common understanding of the liquor control board as being a so-called prohibition era or temperance minded organization but it wasn't they were very much interested in um in drinking right? it may sound weird but they were interested in the right kind of drinking in the right places with the right kind of substances to the right like not too much they also funded research into the wine industry they were very concerned when um beverage room owners were misrepresenting the beer they had so like they would go into the tap room or the keg room and see a whole bunch of kegs from like dow's brewery and then they go outside and the sign said this is labat this is carling this is dow's and it's like oh that's that's illegal right or that was that was dishonest right so they were very much interested in building a reputable drinking system so that was the that's the public drinking thing in bars before that in 1927 what they did was they created <laughs> The, the liquor control board was about the stores was about distribution you couldn't go into a public drinking space until 1934 so I'm sorry I got ahead of myself because my book was on that but um so they created these stores they opened them up gradually across the province and it was you had to have a permit that kind of looked like a um like a uh, a passport like it would open like this and and they would write when you brought it in you would write down you would see a list of what was being sold you didn't see the products in front of you, you saw a list of what was sold you would have a little slip of paper you wrote on that paper what you wanted to buy you took it up to a guy at the counter a man had to be a man at the counter not a woman by any means women and drinking forget that um and then um you would show them your pass your 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 liquor permit which you had to pay a dollar for in the beginning which was not inexpensive and he would look at what you've been buying how much when write in what you bought today how much you know all that stuff and then you and give it to you in a paper, brown paper bag or a few brown paper bags and take it off to the cashier to pay for it right it was a very restrictive system imposed in ways to sort of get rid of a lot of the concerns about people drinking in the stores or people buying too much or people buying so much that they would go off and sell it again in a in a what we would call today well usually popularly they call them speakeasies but they were more often called a blind pig or a, um what was the other one a blind tiger um the idea I don't and we don't know why this this term came about I think it's blind pigs because it was blind from the pigs the cops but I don't think that that was actually where the term came from so they were concerned about all these different ways that liquor could be used illegally you could take that booze home you could drink it at home you could drink it in your hotel room if you're visiting you could drink it in your tent you couldn't drink it outside you couldn't bring it to a friend's house and give it to them right so there were a lot of these restrictions and those restrictions were lasted longer than they probably should have but there was again it was an idea of we're introducing this thing that is really socially problematic at least in the view of many people so we need to do it in a measured way um some people call it Stalin-esque the way the stores were set up but in my reading of it it was very much about being concerned about the the blowback if if you were too too open and too unrestrictive that the temperance movement would just um push again for uh, illegal uh, drinking and, and to deal with some of the illegality that was already there by taking making sure or trying to make sure that most people didn't end up just taking a case of whiskey to their house and selling it to friends and having a party there which would be illegal well it's so interesting and it's sort of the the precursor to what we still have today about a hundred years ago which if anyone is in Ontario or knows about it there is the LCBO the Liquor Control Board of Ontario which is the prominent it is the main distributor and vendor for alcohol in the province and I believe still is the largest alcohol vendor in the world I think yeah I think so I think it still is yeah although I've heard that there's somewhere else I can't remember now 
but the, the interesting thing about the LCBO is something that people from outside of Ontario don't know, but if they ever come here, they might learn about, is that we have this unique thing called the beer store. And it's not a government-run store, but when the LCBO started, I mean, beer is just such a high-volume product, physical product, that putting these stores in, in the middle of a downtown with a massive beer warehouse just didn't work. So they allowed the breweries to to do cooperative sort of warehousing on the edge of town or in wherever they could to get places and you could actually order your beer to your house right so they had a whole delivery system back then um, and this created this was the brewers retail corporation um, that is still in existence and it's now the beer store um, still called the brewers warehousing or brewers retail corporation um, so if you're if you come to Ontario and you go to this place it's not a private company well it is a private company it's not a government company but it's owned by the breweries right so and the big breweries really um, and it's, I think it's unique across North America. I don't know of another mm -hmm. province that has a, a beer store network like that. That's, that's this sort of state created monopoly. Like, and there was a problem about, I think almost 10 years ago now where the craft brewers were saying, we're having a hard time getting into the beer store because it's owned by the big brewers. And so the government actually tweaked the rules and had a whole new agreement with the beer store corporation and also opened up the possibility of beer sales in supermarkets, which was a mm -hmm. for people outside of Ontario, they make a well, why is that a problem? But it was a huge issue at the time. Yeah. No, it's a big deal that we even have. You could buy beer in the grocery store now, which is which is quite new for me, because growing up that's okay. not the way it was. Yeah, for me too. I have pictures of me in front of the first beer store <laughs> or um, supermarket beer display, just pointing to it excitedly. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's, we're finally in the 20th century. <laughs> Here we are in the 21st century. Yeah, we finally made it to the 20th century. Yeah. yeah, but it is. The beer store does have an odd legacy in it, yeah. as well as a an odd contemporary existence being principally owned by the two large beer companies, which is Anheuser-Busch and I think Molson Coors. I think they have the lion's share of this company. Well, the Poro does because they own the Poro. The yeah. Sapporo as well. Yeah. So these, the massive beer companies are the main vendors of sale of beer, which does kind of irritate the, the large, the hundreds of craft breweries that have really emerged. And I know there have been some rules yeah. placed onto the beer store in order to make the, in a bit more of an even playing field in terms yep. of the distribution and the sale, but it's, but it is an odd concept. It would kind of be like if Ford and Chevrolet were the only sellers of cars in the whole country yeah. it's just kind of strange yeah and it's a really interesting thing as well because when that change happened a lot of it was the industry the beer store itself responding to this pressure by making concessions right like so they allowed more of the craft brewers on their board and they promised a certain proportion of their shelf space would be to craft beer and they i think cut the because you had to pay shelving fees so they cut the rates for the first certain number of products that a, a new company will put on there because it really was a block like if you if you couldn't sell at your brewery or if you didn't have part of a network like some other people who would be willing to help you ship your beer and i don't even think that shipping was as easy as just putting stuff on a truck um you had like limited distribution you could go through the lcbo itself but people wanted beer, they usually would go to the beer store. That's changed now, though. Like a lot more LCBO and um, the supermarket sales have, have uh, picked up. And I think during the pandemic, a lot of the brewers, a lot of the rules were loosened up as well. So we've finally gotten beyond the uh, early 1920s model of booze distribution to a certain degree here in Ontario. Yeah. Maybe can you touch quickly on, I really did want to get to this, how sentiments towards the prohibition of alcohol relate to other substances like the yeah. illegal the illegalization of opiate opiates and cannabis and things like that what what is the the relationship between prohibition in the turn of the 20th century and the the illegalization of other substances sure. so the yeah so the, the there's a relationship but it's fairly tenuous so we had this temperance movement which had established this idea that um alcohol like the established idea for many people that alcohol needed strict controls, that addiction to substances was a problem, um, which may seem weird to say, but imagine, you know, if you're addicted to coffee, is that a problem, right? But the idea of addiction 
is a was a problem. It was the idea of giving up your own free will to some substance or to some. And the term addiction itself both means um, you can be addicted to something or you can addict yourself to something. So it's like, how can you be a free autonomous individual if you are willfully giving yourself over? So there was a lot of this idea of addiction that had emerged mostly fueled by concerns of drinking, but connected to that were things like opiates, especially opium, uh, and then morphine when it was, which is a, a, a part of, like, is in opium. And so it was extracted and it was a much um, more potent substance and it usually was be, would be injected. And as these new pharmaceuticals were being developed and people were finding out how addictive they were, there was a lot of concern over control over them. So the first thing that happened in most of you know, the Anglo-American world were pharmacy laws, right? So the pharmacies were licensed to distribute, like to sell medicines, opium, morphine, those were medicines. Um, and that was theoretically the only place you could get it, except some people were doing things like smoking opium, or which wasn't a medicinal use. Well, it was medicinal use, but it wasn't considered a, a sort of a Western medicinal use. It was very much came from China. Um, but the Chinese people were using it for recreation. They were using it for a palliative, for painkilling, all of these different things. And, um, and at the same time, um, cocaine was emerging as a, a new concern, uh, a medicine of concern. Coca had been around for years, has been used in, in, in Central America for years, but German companies started to isolate cocaine as this powder. And it was it is an amazing topical anesthetic. Like it's incredible for you know, dentistry, for ocular surgery, for all of these things where you need, like still we take things like Novocaine or Benzocaine, all of those, things, Lidocaine, those are all synthetic versions of cocaine, right? As topical anesthetics. So it was really useful for that. And it also was helpful if you had a cold or if you had runny nose and stuff or a catarrh is what the, I think is, is how you pronounce it. So it would go into a lot of these medicines. And then opium was also in a lot of medicines uh, like alcohol and opium mixed because opium dissolves in alcohol, something called laudanum or a tincture of uh, opium. And these were sometimes not controlled by pharmacies because they were private products, right? So this growth of this private or this patent medicine market with secret remedies combined with some concerns about Chinese people um, encouraging non-Chinese people in North America to smoke opium along with concerns about cocaine use in certain cohorts of people. So for example, in the Southern US, um, black uh, workers on, um, on farms were given cocaine by their um, employers to increase their energy. And then people started talking about all the Africans who are using cocaine. So it was this weird racial kind of disconnect where it's like, wait, you gave it to them and now you're blaming them for being cocaine users, right? And so all of these different threads, racial and medicinal and concerns about recreation and addiction kind of came together in Canada in the early 1900s. In 1908, we actually had a patent medicine act, a federal patent medicine act to require um, patent medicines to list if they had alcohol, morphine, opium, or I think cocaine was the other one. And then after that, that same year, actually a week or so after those debates, they passed a law to ban the non-medicinal use of opium. And that was, some argue that was targeted only at the Chinese opium users, but I think it was just recognizing this, this recreational gap in the, in the market. So you had patent medicines, you had pharmacies, so they were taken care of, but people using it recreationally weren't covered until the Opium Act came in in 1908. And then a few years later, that law expanded and it was a federal law. And then over time, they just started adding, like the law allowed the government to just add new items to the schedule of prohibited drugs. And that's how come cannabis just ended up on the law in the 1920s, right? Without any kind of debate or anything. Like, in fact, without any indication that a lot of people were using it recreationally. Um, and so, that, so that's the connection between prohibition and that is that these ideas of the useful or the, the how proper it was for governments to prohibit products, which was a new idea. It wasn't government's job to prohibit things. It was the government's job to leave the market open for people to to sell stuff. Um, the idea of prohibiting products for the safety of the citizenship, the citizenry was um, was well established. And so passing these drug laws was um, 
was was easier, especially when you identify other threats, medicinal, physical, racial, those sorts of threats to the nation as the as the problems. Wow, it's so fascinating. Well, I, I do have one final, definite final question before we wrap up. I know it's a sin to ask a historian about the future, but I think we're kind of in an interesting place in terms of, I think, was it 2017 that Canada made cannabis legal yeah. for recreational use? So I guess we're coming up on six years. So that's quite a new age for Canada and quite a unique law to be put into place if you compare it to other yeah. developed nations and North America and in Europe, it's it's quite unusual, not exclusive, but perhaps unusual. Do you see a country like Canada going further in the movement of allowing more substances that are seen as potentially harmful and controversial? Do we do you see in the next decade or so that we'll see more legalization? I know actually British Columbia just yeah. had came with the, the province enacted a law that allowed a certain percentage of recreational what substance was it i forget uh i can't remember which ones yeah. was, um but i know that yeah and that sort of followed the decriminalization decriminalization yeah in um portugal where they de decriminalized um i think all drugs yeah but so so do you see canada becoming more like portugal or, or do you think we'll rewind a little bit in terms of well, we're, the legalization of our of our some of our substances. I don't I don't think we'll rewind. It's really hard. The funny thing about policy is it's a lot harder to do an about face, and that's why you know whatever you think about the current prime minister, I thought it was a really courageous thing for him to campaign on legalizing cannabis because it was such a policy about face, um, and he did it right, which unlike some of the other things he said he would do, but. Um, I think what we're seeing is uh, the growth in concerns about harm reduction, right? Uh, the idea that prohibition of a substance creates other harms to people that do not, um, that are not actually related to the consuming of the substance, but they're related to the the criminalization of it, right? So whether it's dirty needles or um, drugs that are not like that are laced with things that are po that are that are much worse, like fentanyl. Or people who are looking for help, looking for who are who are addicted or concerned about their drug use, but are kind of afraid to disclose it because they might be subject to criminal sanction. All of those things are harms that have nothing to do with the actual effect of the drug in the body, except for the fentanyl, when, when, which is related again to the prohibition because it's not controlled, it's not regulated, it's not analyzed in a lab. Um, and those that's where we get this idea of harm reduction, which is those harms of prohibition could be better managed if it was legal and controlled. And the cannabis one was kind of an easy one because most of the people who were smoking weed in the 60s and 70s are now adult policymakers, knowing that all of the stuff they said about the stuff, this stuff is going to kill you or make you crazy. They're like, yeah, no, it didn't. Right. Like we know that that's BS. Um, and so so we've got this kind of model of a better way of dealing with it, which is control it and manage it and maybe not be as restrictive as Health Canada has been at the beginning. But then we're seeing and but the cannabis legalization came about both because of a legal a series of legal decisions about uh, our, our, our charter of rights that says, you know, we have the right to um, security of the person, I think, is the, the thing that they that the courts often decided was violated by um, things like not providing free needles and or, or clean needles and things like that, but also the uh, growth in medicinal use of cannabis. Right when you can, when you've got uh, seniors with glaucoma, cancer patients who are trying to deal with the effects of chemotherapy, return veterans dealing with PTSD, and all of them are saying cannabis has helped. It it loses its sheen of of corrupt of of corruption or the sheen of sort of uh, deviance, right? When it's when it's medicinal, and we're seeing that now with um, with psychedelics, right? In the in the use of psychedelics, um, psilocybin. I can't remember how to pronounce it. In um, things like uh, in, in psilocybin, I think yeah. psilocybin. Yeah, thanks. I can see the word, but I don't know how to pronounce it. Um, in uh, uh, you know, in things like addiction treatment and in psychotic, um, uh, in, in certain psychotics and things like that, so we're seeing these things that were marginal or were were classified as like really 
problematic drugs for various reasons that were themselves problematic, the political reasons, being reconsidered as, um, as a potential medicinal use. And that, if we look at the cannabis example, takes us towards a point where people are less worried about these as long as they're done in a, as long as they're reintroduced in a way that is not going to um, just make you know, make people crazy <laughs> to, to be really stereotyped about it, right? So the concern is, the, the, so the trend seems to be that if, when it gets more of a sheen of respectability through medical use or through the, the users who are using it recreationally, not kind of becoming part of this kind of weird cult of psychosis that people assumed would happen with psychotics, which didn't normally happen, then then the trend seems to be towards a, a more reasonable uh, control of these substances and availability of these substances. And it may be that we're going to see more of this, um, uh, the decriminalization, at least, if not legalization of more products, because they're, it's, a, it's a better way to deal with them than below prohibition, which just doesn't work. Couldn't agree more. Fascinating stuff. Well, Dan Malik, expert in drug and alcohol regulation and prohibition, professor at Brock University. Dan, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully we can do this again in the near future and I can pick your brain a little bit more on your expertise and knowledge of Canada and its history going back on alcohol, drugs, and controversial substances. So thanks so much and look forward to chatting again in the future. Be sure to subscribe to stay up to date on all our interviews and beer-related content. Remember, craft beer is here.